final webinar of 2020 in partnership with Telesign, identifying the unknowns, the power of alternative data sources in establishing, establishing trust. My name is Alan Good and I'm the CEO and Chief Analyst here at Good Intelligence and I shall be your host for today's webinar. The session is being recorded and will be made available on demand shortly after the event. So no, no matter where, where, where you are in the world, you can listen in at, in, in at any time that suits you, making this event um, especially convenient for our global audience. We start with a keynote presentation from Ebru Keskin, digital identity and fraud prevention expert from Telesign. And then Ebru is joined by Jane Gamble, a payments consultant and program director for a panel session exploring some of the dynamics of this topic moderated by myself. To start off with a couple of housekeeping um, points, we will answer uh, your questions during the panel session after the keynote. Um, to ask a question, please use the Q&A session uh, facility at the bottom of the, your panel. We'll get through as many questions as we can, but we'll also make sure we stay on schedule so that the event flows smoothly. We shall follow up with any unanswered questions after the event has finished. We'll be following up also with uh, a link for the recording of the event. Um, and so without further ado, I would like to welcome Ebru Keskin, digital identity and fraud prevention expert from Telesign with her keynote presentation. Thank you, Ebru. Hello, good morning, everyone. I think it's morning for most of us. Um, welcome on board to another webinar, uh, one of the last ones of the year. Um, I hope everyone's doing well. I'm just going to go right ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, so just bear with me one moment while I do that. Okay. So, um, as you know, this is in conjunction with Telesign, and we wanted to bring you some information and insights into our services and we, we can do in partnership with your um, company. If you have any questions at the end, it'd be great if you can just start writing them out now and we'll go through them. Um, I hope you do have some questions because I know that this is um, not a service that's adopted by a lot of um, companies in the UK, in the EMEA region right now. And is something that we want to introduce because I think it's valuable. And this is why I've, um, I'm on board with Telesign. It's a product I really, truly believe in. And so we can just go right in. So Telesign is a phone number um, focused company giving intelligence and insights and services on um, telephones. So everything from um, SMS, text, verification or insights into phone numbers, which I'll go into. So everything we do is basically all about the phone number, which I think is a great asset um, in terms of data sets for any merchant who's collecting information or processing any kind of payments and information for a customer. So we work with some of the largest um, social media and internet um, services providers in the world. Um, we've been around since 2005. Um, we've started off with OTP messages, which all of you would be familiar with, if, especially if you're doing the free DS um, PSD2 mandate as well. Um, that's basically where we kind of started off and now we've um, gone into different areas of this. It's not just OTP, we do uh, verification and other services on top of that. So you can see the timeline here, bringing us to um, today with all the enhanced services and the additions as well. So what we do, mobile identity, verification and communication. So what can a phone number tell you about your customer? Uh, we provide an API which you can plug into your system, which gives you insights and um, things like reputation on a phone number and just basically understanding the activities that normalize a phone number and the end user who has that phone number in their possession. We also do verification, which you mostly will know as OTP messaging and part of the PSD2 or just login in services if you have um, high security login services with your companies or just use OTP like some of the major merchants do as well. And also communication. So we provide rich and reliable customer um, text messaging services over SMS and voice interactions and also um, voice recording services and call forwarding services as well. Sorry, just gonna minimize my screen. 
what can we do for you in terms of mobile identity solutions? So we provide two services, which is score and phone ID in terms of digital identity and mobile insights. Um, the score delivers reputation scoring based on phone number intelligence, traffic patterns and machine learning, um, and on also a global data consortium that we use to consult to give you an indication of whether this user is high risk, medium or low risk, which is a good customer. We also provide phone ID information, which is detailed and actionable global phone number and subscriber data attributes, um, which will um, strengthen your authentication, evaluate for risk and enhance the user experience. So looking a bit more into SCORE, SCORE delivers um, a risk pattern or phone number intelligence. It's traffic patterns such as how many phone calls this person makes and sort of normalizing that data to understand if that is normal, if it's a normal user, if they make phone calls that actually seem like phone calls or if they've just got a new number and they're using it to possibly commit fraud or just register with various services and providers. So we have a lot of um, comprehensive number intelligence and we have the largest global fraud database of phone numbers in the world. So this is um, what gives us the edge, the fact that we have the, the most information from and we have a very high um, coverage of different providers globally. Um, that would be everyone from O2 and um, Vodafone in sort of UK and other regions as well and also other telecommunication providers that I haven't named. So we have global verification and communication traffic based in risk and trust pattern recognition. And we give you a reputation score. I think that um, if anyone has any GDPR concerns, we are completely GDPR compliant. We use the information that we have from the customers to give you insights and not actually share the entire set of information for you. So there's no GDPR issues around that. It's mostly around the indication of fraud, which we're legally able to share. We have other range of products, um, which I will get to, which is contact match, where we actually get explicit consent from the customers to make sure that we are providing match services with consent and compliance to the GDPR regulation. So score in action, this is what it looks like. Um, there is obviously machine learning component of this as well, because we are normalizing data and usage and also looking at different patterns where we've seen fraud or where we've seen um, what looks like false positives that we think are okay. So we normalize all of the data and we give you an indication with all of the evaluation we make behind the scenes and you get all of this through an API. And then you can decide where in your system and how you'd like to use it and what you'd like to do with this information. So we give you an indication of good behavior and bad behavior. And I would say that bad behavior is things like uh, no, no calls. Um, so a normal number is expected to receive calls and make calls, whether that's prepaid or postpaid um, invoice um, phone numbers. Either way, you would expect some kind of traffic, at least some texting going on. And if there is none of those activities, we assume that this is for fraud and robocalling, or it's just a burner phone, which is used very much in fraud just to register with device, um, different websites to have a fresh number that people don't know or just to in retail it's more used for tracking um, deliveries etc so we give you information and we give you an, an, a risk indication so if we think something is really fraudulent we give you a very high risk indicator and if we just think that this is a normal number with normal amount of um, usage and also not associated with fraud so we keep a data based off when we know that this number is associated with fraud we start indicating that as well so this is the range of um, indications you get. So you can use this in any way and according to your risk appetite. So some customers might want to still take high risk numbers if there is no risk of them losing money in such an um, environment like retail where um, the items are posted out. If it's online games and the transaction is prepaid in some kind of wallet payment, they may not be so alerted to that maybe it's just a person using a different number and restrictions that they're trying to overcome in their region and then we've got communications data and number intelligence so we have 12 billion tra and verified transactions 
30 billion voice minutes and 6 billion messages and 2 trillion roaming messages. So we have indication of a lot of data related to phone number and you get to have access to the largest crowdforce um, fraud consortium database. So we because we are unique in our way and we don't have many other providers in the world that provide the services, our data set has actually contributed to from all our merchants, whereas other um, fraud services providers are split out and there's so many of them, so the data gets split out, it doesn't get shared. So you have an access to a massive impressive database where you can get information about the end user and it's not a particularly static piece of information. Phone numbers may be easy to get, but it's not frequent, it's not normal behavior for a normal person who's transacting normally to have to, um, so many phone number changes or different numbers. So quite often you get really good data. And actually when you don't get good data, it can be an indication of a fraudster or somebody who's just using temporary phone numbers, um, phone numbers that you can get offline, online, offline yeah i guess it's online so you can get um, phone numbers online just use them for otp messages and they sort of disappear within minutes and we can give you insights into whether that number is active and is being used and you will see that in the behavior so any phone number that doesn't make any calls or receive any kind of interaction or data is considered a fraudulent number in the sense that that person is not using it day to day so we have, as you can see here, we have different dimensions and different um, considerations that there are um, artificial intelligence models, which are usually specific to the merchant make. So not every merchant gets the same considerations because the models are thinking about your business type and what is normal and in terms of traffic and behavior for a customer for your company. So we take the phone number and then add dimensions to it. And this is how we um, get all of the information that we can now give you an indication of. So we have behavior based classifications, what we think is a good user and what we think is a risky user. This data is normalized. Obviously, we have all of the data that we're looking at. And if we see sometimes, um, you know, gaps between calls, etc, and it may be normal for a certain region, etc, we normalize this data. So what you're getting is a um, behavior based um, classification sort of that we've been um, using to make sure that we actually understand when it is fraud. And when we've seen cases of fraud, we evaluate what we thought was good behavior and now maybe consider putting that towards risky user. So you can see things like high risk, irregular activity. This could be excessive number of calls as well. Um, so sometimes phone numbers are used for other types of fraud. If there's so many numbers being called in one day, it could be that that, that user's just got this number and they're using it for other types of fraud as well. And so um, you also have call center like activity, which means that there's actually a fraud ring that's involved. So there are people that are getting commissions by um, actually working in a call center geared towards fraud. Some workers probably don't even know that they're committing fraud. They are um, calling people up for a range of services, et cetera. And then you have good user profile, which is regular activity. Um, it's always seen in the last 15 days. So we kind of expect um, normal users to actually have some kind of activity in the two week period, which we think is normal, et cetera. And obviously these are also configured towards each merchant and different merchants may see different traffic levels and their normal may look different. So we have the score out Put, which is a basic one, which is a clean cleanse phone number, which is when customers start entering their phone numbers in an incorrect format, either not providing the, um, the country codes or just not writing out their phone numbers correctly. And so we um, normalize that, make sure that you are given a correct number in the right format. We also have original phone type classification, so phone, different phones, different providers, and also carrier information. So um, that it includes anything where custom, um, customers have carried numbers over to different providers. We can tell you who the number belongs to. And then we have the risk level, which is the severity of the risk. Um, this is when a few slides before I was talking about the different indications that we can give you in terms of this phone number and its use and its reputation. 
And also there's recommendation, what we think you should do. So if we think it's very high risk, we would suggest that you don't accept this transaction or investigate thoroughly to make sure that this customer is somebody that you'd like to do business with. And we also provide a risk score for a phone number. So score output looks like this. Um, it's a, a very simple API. Um, it's very simple to integrate and you can decide where in your system this goes and how this information is processed at your end. We don't provide um, an interface. So this is something that works with your current systems and providers as well. Um, we also provide phone ID services. Um, phone ID services um, answer even more context based on critical questions about users by using their phone numbers. So um, you can understand things like their subscription, their device, updates, etc. Sometimes fraudulent users don't tend to take the updates that you're pushing out. So if you have any apps, um, in my experience, when we would um, create a new app and share the um, update, uh, the adoption was 90% for most normal users and then towards the end the last few percent used to be fraudsters who now realize that their details are being scrutinized or there's more security measures and they actually read the description of the updates and they will not update because they don't want any additional security measures and until they do they will um, continue using old versions of your apps and they will actually manage to override some of your new security measures unless you force update and we can provide insight into that. So basic in information attributes can be, uh, we have different subscriber levels and different information that we can provide. We have the standard where you can have some of the insights and then we go all the way up to live uh, where we receive phone number, current status, whether it's active or not, which can be valuable in terms of um, knowing whether this phone number is still valid so you can actually call um, our services to find out if a phone number that's registered with your website is still current and active and we also provide um, different device information and subscriber status on the different levels of um, services that you could take with us um, some of the contact information attributes, receive phone number contact information, name and address related to the submitted phone number. So we can match as much as the, these as that comes back and we will try to match as much as possible. So you won't get a, a match or no match, you'll get a partial match where a name matches, but perhaps the, um, the street address doesn't match or the phone number. And there's always consent for this, so this is completely GDPR compliance. So these are the levels. And so we have contact match as well, which also gives you a score on the address and it gives you a score on the name and the surname. So this isn't simply saying that this matches. It also tells you whether this is um, high risk or actually a good user. We also have services that can help with account takeover detection. Um, account takeovers have been um, sort of like happening quite a lot lately, especially because security measures are getting tighter. So forces are trying to find different ways of accessing information and account takeovers tend to help them gain a lot of um, gain full access to people's bank accounts, um, accounts where um, bank details are registered. And if they can take over phone numbers as well, they can receive the OTP message and reset everything. So imagine if somebody took over your phone number, they could reset your bank, um, your um, you know Amazon or different accounts and actually have the OTP messages and lock you out of it as well. And it can be a very difficult process getting that back. And we also have other services like SIM swap um, detection, which is a, a fraud that's happening quite a lot recently where um, they're calling carriers and actually just requesting your SIM to be swapped over to a SIM that they have. And no, they no longer post the SIM, so it's really easy to do it within minutes over the phone. Or they do, or we can give indications of whether a number is having call forwarding. So they could have fraudulently taken over a number and just put a call forward to ensure that they can take um, the calls. So I'm going to just get past this. I guess there's a lot of information here, and we have some of the sample solution flows and onboarding here. So we have the user register um, with the phone. 
and you get insights from us. There's the registration data and the registration is completed. So this is basically just the flow of how you're on board with us and how um, you can start getting our services. I'm just going to get past this. And so we've basically, um, we're completely global. As you know, we trade over, I can't remember how many countries, but basically have a pretty global coverage. And if you have a look at some of the stats here, we have 104 million users um, blocked user recommendations in one year. We have a 55% reduction in fraud and chargebacks and 70% fraud registrations stopped. So um, reduce 50% of um, fraud transactions in mobile wallet companies. And you can see that there's a global success there where people are able to utilize mobile number intelligence and actually use this insight to stop fraudulent registrations, transactions and users. Our solutions are mobile identity, verification and communication, which I've just gone through. Um, just to remind you of all the services, we're basically talking about data and mobile identity today, but we have other services such as communication, which is texting and SMS services. So um, some of the um, information we are able to provide as well over SMS Verify is um, basically making sure that your end users are current and active. I think a lot of use, um, people are using this for um, OTP, but it can be done for logging in services and other services where um, customers have to be verified with a two-factor authentication. We can also do voice verify when you've got call centers and you need to ensure your customers are who they say they are. So I'm just gonna go over this. There's a lot of um, insight into that. So um, in the um, next few minutes and um, 40 minutes, we'll be discussing some of our services in terms of what we can do to provide insights into different data sets. Um, I believe that um, um, different data we receive are assets and we need to look into it. And phone number is one of the few data sets that people just aren't looking into enough. And hopefully we can just provide some insight into how this can be used going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Abu. That was very informative and very uh, rich in information there. I think as, a, as an analyst, what we're seeing is that a trend both in identity and in authentication and, and fraud detection is that a move away from reliant on static identifiers and moving to much more active live data, which gives you a much more accurate picture of, of, of fraud attempts and also the likelihood that it, it is the real person who's um, um, trying to access the service or open up an account. That was uh, that was very good. Um, just a reminder, any questions that, that you have, and we've had a few already, um, please use the, the Q&A function on, on, on the bottom of your screen. Um, I would like to uh, invite, I see Jane back with us now. Thank you, Jane. Um, I'd like to start off with quite a, an overriding um, question. And I'd like to ask you, Jane, first, is that in your opinion, from your experience, how has the COVID era kind of changed business and commerce? Um, I think it's it's accelerated actually from the face-to-face -to, -face to online, obviously. Um, we already were experiencing uh, quite a step change in terms of moving online, uh, particularly in the banking arena, which is, um, you know, where I come from basically. And um, also, as we all know, I mean, the, the shopping ha and gaming has been online and moving that way exponentially, in fact, uh, prior to coronavirus. But when COVID-19 really hit, it really has accelerated the whole process. Um, transactions are online. Uh, onboarding for banks is now online. Um, and in fact, looking at the opportunities for fraud when you try to open an account um, with a bank, then something like checking the, the telephone patterns, the, the usage, is actually a very good source of information. Um, there's a lot of online verification tools that should be used, that are being used by 
so the challenger banks and they should really be adopted by the traditional banks as well so literally the world has changed in the last nine months and we have gone online we need to find new sources to give us more trust that the two parties are who they say they are and that goes both ways i think um so yes um i'm very supportive of, of any innovation that brings in extra items of, of data and information that supports a level of an increased level of trust. Thank you. So everything from your point of view, um, what are you seeing? Uh, what challenges have you know, Telesign have as an organization this year and your clients and, and how have uh, um, you know, Telesign and the services kind of reacted to, to support the kind of the drive to digital? Um, I think what's happened this year is that we've seen a lot of merchants who were very digitally ready succeed in the COVID lockdowns and the restrictions and going out. And anybody who hasn't been that prepared has sort of suffered a lot because their um, their systems just weren't able to deal with all the new clients and um, and also some of their customers weren't able to reach all of their services and products online straight away. And so there was a bit of a scramble to um, get run online and what's happened with all the online sales and transactions going up I think over 200 percent more and in fact 230 percent globally is also that the fraud rates go up with it so fraud rates if we consider that it's around the soft spot is around one percent we'd like to aim for that's actually ideal which we accept even Visa and MasterCard sort of can live with that, but it's usually around the 2% mark. So when you have a 234% uplift in sales, you also have that 2% growing in number as well. And actually that rate's gone up. And what's happened is some of the merchants haven't been able to verify a lot of customers. So they've lost a lot of sales where they're seeing a lot of high risk behavior from customers who aren't used to being online or they're seeing lots of fraudulent activity which they can't monitor and weed out from the other false positives. And so they've had a high number of declines. And what's happening is that, that some of the traditional forms of fraud checking is not active enough. So when I have an email that's new, all that you know is that it's a new email. You don't have any further information because it's not updated in a live environment. It's updated through different systems and usage and time of file. Where we use phone numbers that are live, you're getting insight into that end user using a piece of information that's actually quite reliable. I know mobile numbers can be very dispensable and you can get new ones easily, but that's also an indication of fraud as well. An ordinary user who's spending around 2000 hasn't just gotten their phone number that morning. It's not been active for 30 minutes. That's unusual behavior. It can happen, but I just don't see scenarios where that's happening. So most of the time, the information you get from us is accurate about that user and their behavior with that phone number which is a very valuable asset it's not easy to get rid of because most people don't like to change their numbers and we can track changes where different network providers have changed and if people move over to a new contract they take their number we can provide indications of that and i think these are the kind of information that um, merchants need as fraudsters get more sophisticated so everything's gone online and a lot of crime has gone online as well. So people are looking at different ways of exploiting the situation where everything's now available online and there is actually no risk of being sort of arrested because you're not in store or you're not in the bank yourself. So if you are committing any kind of fraud with the bank or um, any financial services or a merchant, you're not there to be physically sort of caught. So people are braver, they're trying different things, they're trying and then Investing in technologies and information, you know, the dark web is full of our details, basically, and it takes the right fraudster to be able to utilize it with the right merchant, right provider, and get a lot of, um, you know, benefits from it. So some merchants have different processes where I can override certain, uh, you know, free DS rules on the web by just phoning people up and getting information or access to services that way. I've just overridden someone. So fraudsters are also coming online and they're getting lots of information. They're getting lots of different software. So I think what merchants need is all the insight they can have 
to look at different data sets they're able to collect without adding friction to their services. So you don't want to ask for more information. What you want to do is get deeper into the information you currently collect. So you don't have to just change your entire checkout and login in process. You're more just having a sort of fresh look at what you've collected and also your database of customers that have provided this information as well. So typically, this is how your clients use your service. And obviously, mobile is a, is a really important growing channel for, for commerce. So if, if we're talking cross-channel commerce, if we're talking web and mobile, typically, how does a client, do they kind of then aggregate that data and bring in other data sources and then create, uh, you know, a, a risk scoring based on multiple data sources? Um, I think so. It depends on the sector. So um, in terms of gaming clients that I've had in the past, um, they basically use all of these fraud services to, to make a decision. So they don't just take our insight and make one decision out of it. They have different sources of information. So they use other providers. They use, um, you know, address postcode lookup. They look at age verification, etc. And they use all of this insight. So it's valuable in that way. And then you have merchants who are just sort of like taking the decision you make and making a decision to accept or decline a transaction. But I think what people really should be focusing on is data consistency um, through different platforms, making sure that, you know, your mobile app is collecting the same information and running it against the desktop accounts, etc., and just looking for consistency in the data. But every single merchant in, in different verticals is using this information differently. Some of them just like to use it on boarding to make sure that they have clean, good data and the phone numbers are correct. And some of them like to use it in the checkout where they are just making sure that the, you know, the payment information uh, is coherent and the phone number used for tracking is actually a good number that you should be transacting with. Okay. So how, how, how as a service provider, an e-commerce provider, how can they ensure, how can they rely on, on, on trustworthy data? I mean, what is classified as, as trustworthy data? Um, I think there is nothing out there that's 100%. I think there's a, an element of uh, risk in every single data point and we have to just make our sort of best assumptions and we have high levels of confidence in our data and this is something that um, we have merchants that are using it completely to make decisions and we have merchants that are using it to help form their decision and because we have artificial intelligence um, models built into our systems we're learning from our merchants as well where we're seeing fraud for normal behavior we're adjusting that normal behavior to include this kind of behavior that could be possibly fraudulent and where we're seeing false positives we're also normalizing that as well so it can vary i think um either way it's whatever the merchant feels comfortable with because obviously it's one source of information, but it's a good source of information to enhance the rest of it. Because a lot of fraud providers, fraud provi um, prevention providers are providing information that's specific to their system. And so, for example, I'll give you an example. If you use any one service, you have information relating to that from that fraud prevention provider. Because we're a telecommunications provider and we have access to all of the phone numbers in the world, that means that we have a bigger database that we're querying against. And so we don't have the restrictions that um, the fraud prevention providers have the split of data and the insights. It might be just mobile number, but it's still a bigger database. So you get good, reliable information that you can actually make your decisions on. You can just say, this is a very high risk number. I don't want to transact. It's no different to saying this is a dodgy email, so I don't want to send any services. It like software as a service providers, sometimes block users just because their emails are considered high risk and they could do the same with phone number sign-ins as well. Okay. Jane, any experience from, from your side in terms of you know, reliance on on trustworthy data to make a, a decision either on, on account opening or, or during that yeah. identity authentication process? Yes, I think, um, I think the fact is that in the banking world in particular, we have relied on very traditional sources of, of ID. And that has actually shut out um, a whole swathe of people from um, the banking services 
Uh, that's why we've seen so many challenger banks actually start up. Um, but one of the things that I actually see in, in the alternative sources of data um, that can create trust, like, like the one we've been talking about, is that, say, um, youngsters who have, they need to open a bank account, they've, they don't have access to financial services, they haven't got a credit record, um, they probably have got a passport, but they might not have. Uh, but therefore, they find it very difficult to actually open an account. Or if they do open an account, they get very, very basic facilities until they, in quotes, have proved themselves. Now, they've probably had a phone and they've paid for a phone and they've used that phone perfectly normally for a number of years. And therefore, actually having that data creates a level of trust and can actually give them an avenue into um, better financial services to to actually um, enhance their credit record and uh, get them on the way really. And again, going back to coronavirus and, and the current pandemic, it's really hit that particular strata of the population hard and they need all the help they can get. Therefore, don't let's punish them for not having the traditional IDs that, that allow them to open an account and get a line of credit, get an overdraft, get a credit card. You know, let, let's let's actually use these alternative sources. Yeah, very good point. So, so Ebru, in terms of the type of client that you have, the type of people who are using this at the moment, is is it is it more the the, the kind of the startups, the kind of the the agile challenger banks, or is it a service for 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 you know, new and old service providers alike? Um, so we, I think we can cater for everyone across the board. We have some of the largest providers, including social media providers in the world. So um, I wouldn't just say that we're geared towards um, startups, but absolutely startups do benefit from our services and we have a lot of insight. So some of the discussions I've had recently are actually with some of the cryptocurrency companies, which are new, um, as you would know, Jane, as well. It's one of the, um, the thing that some of the traditional banks have been sort of behind in. Cryptocurrency is really big at the moment anyone who's got bitcoins would agree it's a good time right now for having some cryptocurrencies if you've invested um, you've done well and so these can be difficult to verify because they are non-traditional so like you said Jane they're not really relying on passports they're not relying on birth certificates or driving licenses and these are youngsters who like agile who are just using their mobile you know mobile usage is over 65 percent with those users not even interacting with the desktops. So I think I actually use laptops because professionally I have to work with them. But in my personal life, when I'm interacting with any services, I'm using mobile services. And so that actually that there's a lot of consistent data that can be gotten um, from uh, available from that. So if you look at trading platforms that are mobile only, you look at different providers that are providing ways of spending cryptocurrency um, through traditional spending like credit cards, um, they only rely on phone numbers as login. So I just give you my email or login and my phone number and some of them have an OTP message and then you log in. But nobody's really looking into the data that they're sending the OTP message to. So they're just sending it to me because I've told them that this is my number, so send me a text. And as long as I have access to that number, you know, it's fine. But nobody's really checking to see, actually, have you just sent the OTP message to a really dodgy number or, you know, have you got information? Do you know that this is my number? And you could have that as a, a term because you haven't interacted a lot with that client so what do you have and if you create consistency in the data it could be very valuable and a lot of the um, crypto and digital services companies are finding that actually if they get score id and contact match they're in a really good place because that number belongs to their account holder 
and the number is behaving in a normal way. So that gives them confidence and they can actually continue to make sure that they check this. And a lot of regulators are asking for this. And I'm talking about traditional regulators like FCA and, you know, licensed authorities in different regions um, in Europe and Germany. We've been speaking to a customer who's now just getting um, a license and they need to make sure that the customers are verified in an ongoing fashion. So you're not just collecting the information that one time you need to continue interacting with that um, customer and to make sure that you're getting live information to make sure that there's no uh, because you need to track things like money laundering and so that's a mandate everybody has to follow and it's easy to use these um, data points to track information and to make sure you're sort of if I keep depositing and withdrawing you can monitor through my phone number it's not something that I could change and if I changed it you could just completely disable my account and say you've changed your number we need to re-verify you why have you changed your number it's normal it could happen but it shouldn't happen like all the time and yeah. so it gives um, merchants that level of confidence that actually i'm interacting with the right person and i can if i wanted to go ahead and match their details with their phone number details and see what information i have available and i think that anyone can use our services everyone from um, startups digital all the way to enterprise and they do and they get a lot of insights and information as well yeah and i think that's if i can just um make a comment there. It's an interesting point that you make on the, the fraud side, uh, because particularly when you brought in about um, stable coins, et cetera, or you know, Bitcoin, um, cryptocurrencies. Now, from a, a banking perspective, of course, there's, there's a number of um, question marks over cryptocurrency and, and what they're used for, and, and they are used uh, in the dark web for nefarious uh, activities, as well as just um, by normal people for investment purposes. But being able to have access when you're, let's just say when you, you've onboarded somebody and everything's fine, you could actually have information regarding their activities elsewhere, which actually leads you into questioning just how trustworthy is that person or that company yeah. and and that's that's actually a very important insight because that is a growing area of of, of risk for banks uh, you have what you call sleepers so they'll 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 be good customers they'll be good actors for um, a number of months, perhaps even years, um, and then suddenly they're rogue. Yeah. Now, it could be rogue because they've been taken over, or there's other circumstances, um, or they they meant to be rogue, they've, they're just planning way ahead. Uh, but the fact is that you don't know in a bank until it's actually happened. And I think the other thing is that um, there is a lobby ongoing at the moment to perhaps um, reduce the amount of um, the amount of liability that a bank has to address fraud for customers and I do think that if that goes ahead then then banks need to actually make sure that they address as much as they can in every way they can transaction actually go through mm -hmm. and again any source of information that helps track and stop fraudulent transactions where you know your bank account might be emptied in in minutes seconds in fact it, it needs to it needs to happen you can't be you can't just say to a customer Yes, well, sorry. You can't. Yeah. You have to be able to say, okay, yeah, it must have been, you must have given your, your ID to somebody or your PIN to somebody because we've got all this stuff in place that actually says it was you yeah. that did this yeah. transaction. So, so yeah, again, 
I think there's there's a number of opportunities um, that any any extra source of information is a valuable source of information. Um, and it was interesting when you said about actually joining these these all together to give a picture. And I think that's very important. You can't just take um, one point, one source of information and not actually merge it with the other sources of information to give a full picture of, of the client or the transaction or the merchant that you're dealing with. Yeah, definitely. definitely. So, um, Ebba, you mentioned about SimSwap earlier on and, and I've seen a massive uptick in, in um, SMS OTP and I know the figures are are quite significant in terms of the increase as a result of PSD2 SCA. So, and so SimSwap is obviously a, a, a big issue. So how big an issue is it? And, and what can Telesign and, and products of Telesign do to, to, to prevent it? Um, so SimSwap came about because um, of online banking being available through and, and also I think Apple Pay as well. All of these wallet payments are interacting through phone numbers and you can register a different card and then you get an OTP. Once you confirm the text, you're able to register it to a new device. And also with a lot of um, um, providers and banks sending OTP messages for free DS confirmation, um, a SIM swap has been a go-to. So I'm able to get hold of um, somebody's OTP message for any provider by their bank or their merchant services, et cetera. And then I can take over their account. I can reset their um, email address and um, password as well, etc. And what we can do is give an indication of that happening. So we can tell you that, that this phone number has had a SIM swap in this time frame and that gives you um an understanding of like why that might be and you can actually further check that customer or just put them on hold for a short period of time because sim swaps um tend to be short-term um fraud so obviously i'm going to notice that i'm not getting calls within a few hours and mm. sort of fix that with um, my phone provider but for the period that they are that merchant is unaware of that. And that, that's the insight that gives them that information. So it's very easy to stop an order for a few hours and just hold off on it until you're able to verify that customer or just say, you know, I'll re-verify you in 12 hours and then you can have this service or product or you can have access to your online banking again. And Apple does this quite often. So whenever you change an email, they have a cooling off period. They actually won't give you that information for 48 hours, which allows the real user to have access back to their account so they can actually object, etc. And actually having our insights and services allows you to have the same facility where you can actually um, hold off of that customer's interactions with your services, especially banks are at risk for that. Because if I register a new phone number, I mean, I mean if I've got a new um, phone and I register a different Apple Pay, Apple Pay tends to override a lot of security measures because merchants just trust it. Um, so I've noticed through my shopping experience that everybody um, will just override all of their traditional methods of fraud checking in favor of Apple and they push it further into the checkout. That gets done by tech teams. So tech teams want to provide a, a great customer service, which is different payment providers and having um, a sort of um, a wallet payment like you know, Google Pay, Android Pay, Apple Pay, and bringing that further in the basket, they override a lot of security measures because they trust the, the, the wallet payments. And what's happened is if I've gone into the ecosystem of Apple and registered a new um, card and I've got um, a SIM swap that's happened that's allowed me to, nobody really knows. So um, you could go further to say that actually that end merchant can verify that number, make sure that it's live as well, then they can know if that number has been taken over at any point. So okay. there's a lot of, um, basically what happens is like what Jane said, people get into this good ecosystem and behave really well. And if nobody is disrupting them, they leave it alone to get lots of um, trust because some um, merchants actually base their fraud prevention on time seen. So if they've seen a customer for six months, they assume trust and not go back and check their details again. 
that tends to happen at the payment point or in the initial sign up point. And there are some services and products and merchants that only ever check you on onboarding like banks and trading and digital services or software as a service companies, whereas retailers tend to sort of check you again with every transaction. So they have different um, checkpoints and some of them are missing out on the live information as well, which can give you an indication of fraud as well. Somebody getting into the safe ecosystem, like Jane said. Yeah, I understand. So, so what's the biggest motivator, motivator for uh, a digital service provider to deploy your technology? Is it is it the um, is it the big hammer from regulation and compliances, or is it more kind of the kind of to ensure smooth, convenient, frictionless kind of um, uh, um, service delivery. So, in, in terms of that scales, which one is the is, is the number one or, or, or the or the biggest motivator for a service provider? Um, so, some of it can be quick. So, when just the, the the efficiency in getting information that's live within seconds and checking it against a database that is actually also being updated live. So, we've seen some of the um, service providers freeze their customers' services until a certain period has passed. So, if you've got a credit card, they won't allow you to spend anything on that online for 30 days, which is a loss to a lot of credit card companies because everybody's shopping online and to stop a customer shopping for 30 days is a long period of time. So by using our services, they're able to verify that customer very, very quickly and have them shopping online immediately instead of sort of waiting for behaviors to come in that they can then decide is fraudulent or not when they don't have enough um, sources of information because with credit card providers, they don't ask for emails, they, they get your traditional details, so they don't know if you are fraudulent until you behave in that way because they're not able to monitor that transaction, they're only able to monitor your onboarding. So they basically freeze cards until certain periods pass. So we can help overcome that. And there's also merchants that are really high risk that are getting loads of attacks from Forces with different credit cards, you know, high value items, etc., with good resale values, um, they need to enhance what they have. So they can't just have a fraud service and use it and leave it because they're seeing really high levels of fraud. And when you have high levels of fraud, you have issues with the schemes and your acquiring services as well because of um, free DS, you know, everybody has to have 0 0.5 or below. And maintaining that can be difficult. And when you keep seeing peaks, this is the merchant's responsibility now to reduce that peak. Otherwise, the acquiring services start having problems and want to reduce or um, shut down their gateway. So as a gaming provider going over a certain percentage or any retailer that's getting a lot of fraud attacks, they have to be mindful of their um, chargeback rates being too high. So they need to um, use additional services for investigations and just blocking some of the transactions online as well. Right, we're coming to the end of um, we're coming to the, the, the end of the session. Any um, closing remarks from 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 you, Abra and Jane? Um, yeah, I I think that the banks, in particular, the financial institutions, um, should be more open to looking at alternative sources of of information to create trust. Uh, not just from an onboarding perspective, but ongoing. Um, you know, CDD within banks is is a regulatory requirement. It has been since 2016. So this needs to be more proactive rather than reactive, which is what mm -hmm. it is at the moment. And, um, you know, it's the old adage about shutting the stable door when the horse has already bolted. But sure. you, this, any type of immediate information that actually shows that a pattern's changed, that there's a problem, should be embraced. Um, and I do think that, you know, in this mobile world, it's, it's key to use mobile information why wouldn't we? Yeah, good point. Good point. Everyone? Um, I think that's an excellent point. Um, 
mobile is over 65% with some of the countries and regions going straight to mobile and never actually getting things like, um, you know, iPads or Macs or PCs, they've just gone straight to mobile. And there's a lot of data consistency that merchants can actually track and create themselves. So a lot of merchants are finding that they can actually have their own fraud prevention ideas and systems or procedures and we can be a part of that we can give you insights and information and also there are different processes that can be implemented in terms of you know retailers stopping friendly fraud there are no fraud prevention um, software that can actually detect if your customer is going to go rogue on you but you can actually look at delivery information and the phone number and just understand what's happening and changing at that process to see if you can stop some of that as well. We can give an indication of that to any associations with fraud in that way. So I think basically, like I said on before, you don't suddenly ask for 10 pieces of information. If you're getting three or four pieces of information, which we, we all do, it's more about looking into that information. And there's only so much querying you can do about a person's name. We, we get the, the records already. Addresses can be changed in terms of spelling emails can be changed but phone number tends to be quite static it tends to be more solid it's more of a, a data asset that goes both online and offline if you think about it a phone number is an offline data source as well because there's, there's a chip there's a device attached to it which we can also um, get in information on as well and so this is basically creating that omni-channel um, KYC and checking your mobile is the only source of information that goes online and offline very successfully because you could have a phone that doesn't have any 3G, 4G, 5G, but it still receives text and you can still receive calls and it still is a good way of verifying your customer. So I think um, there's a lot of information that we need to look into at the data sources that we already collect. Brilliant, thank you. Well, thank you to Ebru and Jane for an insightful look at the power of alternative data sources and establishing trust. And a big thank you to our audience for your time and questions. Um, I hope you have taken away something of value from today's virtual event. If we didn't manage to get around to answering your questions, we should be following up with all of them to ensure you get an answer. Recording from today's event will be available shortly and we'll be in touch with details in how to access this recording. Look out for future events from us um, into 2021. And on that note, I would like to thank you all for attending. Stay safe and well.